right, so I'm really excited to be able to just to set the tone for what's happening next. And it's going to look a little different than what we normally do on a Sunday, but I think it's super special. And I actually sat in the 815, and I can't wait for you guys to hear what the Lord has through these men. And just everything that they said just really, honestly, is what I needed to hear. So I can't wait for you guys to hear that. And so I'm going to introduce them, and I'm going to just kind of share what the day is going to look like this morning. And so um, Cody Finch is going to be speaking for us first. Can we can we cheer for Cody? Woohoo! <laughs> Woo uh, we're so excited for Cody. Uh, he and Lauren, his wife, um, are good friends of ours. We got Leighton in here and Emerson. We love this family dearly. We get to do life with them in community group and um, they are amazing and um, I love the authenticity that they have and that they've been able to share with Todd and I. And um, Cody serves, I wanna make sure I get this right, as director of student athlete development yes at Lee University do we have any Lee people in here yeah I see some athletes I know um, Cody also does that at Lee and I know that he has a heart um, for students and I get to watch him do that and I love seeing that so Cody's gonna share with us and then we've got Sam Anderson he is our student pastor he's gonna share that's right he's gonna share as well and we love him and Jace his wife they pour into our students um, and I just, I'm so, so thankful for them. Students, aren't you guys thankful for them? They're amazing. Yeah, we're so glad. So Cody is gonna speak to us first and then we're gonna have a time of response, a time of worship. And then after that, Sam is gonna come up and we'll have another opportunity to honestly just reflect and worship because I said what they have to say is so good. And honestly, that time of worship is needed. And so can we just welcome Cody as he comes and I'm gonna hand it off to you. Perfect, thank you. Okay, if you could only watch one TV show for the rest of your life, your favorite TV show of all time, I want you to think about it. Okay, you got it? I want you to share it to the person next to you. Ready, go. Favorite TV show of all time. Really? No, okay. Perfect. Thanks for sharing. So I asked some people in my life, shows came up like uh, The Office, uh, Seinfeld, Friends, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Some people in my life right now are watching Suits, and uh, there's all these different shows, right? And so the reality is when we talk about the shows that we love that we could watch over and over and over, really uh, it comes down to we may like the plot, we may like the story, there's probably some conflict in there that hooks us in, but the reality is we get connected to the characters in that story. Right? Like, I don't know about y'all, but sometimes my wife, Lauren, and I, we can just be going throughout our week and we can reference people or characters from TV shows like they're real people. Y'all do that? It's like, remember that time that Michael Scott said that hilarious thing? Okay, we may be the only ones. That's fine. But, <laughs> but the idea that, like, sometimes when we watch these TV shows, we can begin to think and the lines can be blurred that these actors giving this performance are like real in our lives. And that's, y'all, that's my story. I grew up in an awesome home with two parents who loved Jesus with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And they taught me the reality of unconditional love and grace as I grew up. But also what happened in my life was the world was telling me a different story. The world was telling me that if I performed, that I would be loved more. That if I was able to act a certain way and do a certain thing, that maybe I would get a little more praise. And so early on in my life, I bought the lie that God would love me more if I just performed better. And so I began to pick up the role of what I thought it meant to be a good Christian boy. And I started to learn and I started to memorize the lines that I thought people wanted to hear. I learned what to say. 
I learned how to say it. I learned when to say it and when not to say it, and I just became this actor in my own story where I was known by everybody, but known by nobody. And in my story, what I thought was the more and more I could perform, the more and more the role I could play in my life, what I saw was the better I got at it, the more praise I got. And everybody in my life didn't seem to care what was really going on in my heart and my mind, except for my mom and dad. And that's part of the role of a mom and dad. And so when they begin to press in a little bit into my heart because I was saying the right things, I was doing the right thing, because in that part of my story, y'all, I was just playing the role of what I thought it meant to be a Christian. But the reality is when they begin to press in, I felt uncomfortable, so I would throw up two walls. I would throw up a wall of intensity and I would get really intense, or I would throw up a wall, and I would do the silent treatment and make everybody around me pay. And the way that I treated my mom and dad in that season of my life is one of my greatest regrets in my story. But I didn't know what to do, y'all, because I was carrying a secret. You know what secret I was carrying? That even though I was playing a role internally, deep down in my heart, I was a fraud because I knew what to say, how to say it. And there were seasons after season after season where I had lost myself because I knew the knowledge and I had been living around Jesus for most of my life. They don't give out golden globes or Academy Awards for people, actors in their own story. But if they did, y'all, I would have at least been in the nomination. I was really good. I was so good that in this part of my story, I had landed myself a role as a leader at a Christian sports camp. My first year of college in May of 2008. You see, I had played the part perfectly. I had memorized the scriptures. I had gone through the interview process and nobody had any idea. And it was in this moment that I made a decision that my greatest threat was exposure. If anybody knew the real, what was going on, that I didn't have any idea what I was doing, my greatest threat I thought was exposure. And so I I hid this secret deep down in my heart and I made the decision that nobody would ever know. But Ephesians Two starts off in verse 1 and says, we were dead in our trespasses and our sin. But verse 4 starts off and says, but God being rich in mercy sent Jesus to us. Not only did he send Jesus 2,000 years ago, but I'm thankful that he sent Jesus into my story in May of 2008 because what had happened is I had landed this role for me at that time had given the performance of a lifetime, and I was a leader at a Christian sports camp. And it was the night before all of the kids were going to come the next day. A couple hundred kids were going to show up. There was about 150 leaders. And our leadership had built a fire down in the woods, and we had all gathered. And they had built this fire, and they said, hey, If we're going to see God move, we got to get right with him. So this is a time to share and confess and repent and restore and renew whatever we need to do. We need to posture ourselves before God so that he can move when these students get here. And then they sat off to the side and began to pray because we know that great leadership knows it's not even about the physical realm that we live in, but a lot of our battle is in the spiritual So we got to get right with the Lord. And you know, it was a group of about 150, 18 to 22 year old young men. So we weren't really stoked about the idea of sharing all our mess around a fire. And it was quiet for about five minutes. And then before I knew it, 
it felt like somebody had picked me up and for the first time in my life, I had dug deep down and I had pulled up this box that I had locked a long time ago. And I had opened it and I was beginning to share with these guys I had just met maybe four days before all of my mess and my sin. And I ended with, y'all, I think I've been living around Jesus my entire life, but I don't think I've ever entered a relationship with him. And I'm a fraud. And I think I need to know Jesus. And so I was crying. A bunch of people had come around me and they began to lead me in this really sweet time of prayer with the Lord. And in that moment, the Lord showed me two things. He showed me that what I thought was my greatest threat was actually my greatest strength. And what I thought playing a role was my greatest strength was actually my greatest weakness. And this is what he showed me. He showed me I had been playing my hope had been in the role I had been playing for most of my life. The role of having it all together, looking like I played the part, the role of a good young Christian kid. And I knew about Jesus, but I didn't know Jesus. I'd been living around Jesus, but up until that point, my hope had been in the performance of Jesus rather than the person of Jesus. My hope had been in the wrong thing. My hope had been in the role that I played rather than the relationship that he had offered for me. And so in that moment, I got to pray and the Lord began to change my heart and my life as I realized my hope was not in the role of playing a Christian, but my hope was in the relationship with Jesus. My hope had been not in the performance, but in the person. And I got to lay that down. And the Lord showed me that what I thought was my greatest threat in a role was exposure, right? As an actor, you, you can't let anybody know what's actually going on. Exposure in my role was my greatest threat. But in a relationship with Jesus, exposure is my greatest opportunity, Because 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says this. This is what it says. Paul's talking and he says, but he, Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power works in weakness. I'm here to tell you that it's because of Jesus and his power and grace that I'm able to live with hope. Not because I'm perfect or the perfection of a performance, but it's in the person and power of Jesus. Because in my weakness, he is strong. And so exposure in a role was my greatest threat. But when I got to meet Jesus and be in a relationship with him, I understood that exposure was my greatest opportunity to, for it not to be about me, but for it to be about Jesus. And the other thing that I thought playing a role and being about performance was independence. I thought, you know what? I'll do it. Nobody will know. Independence was my greatest strength. But in relationship, y'all, independence is your greatest weakness. Because we were never meant to do it by ourselves. Christ enters into our story and he offers us the hand and we get to lay down the idea of performing for him and we get to take the hand of the person of Jesus and get to walk with him in this deep, awesome, intimate intimate relationship with him. Not based on what we can do, but based on what he's done for us. And that moment in May of 2008 as a leader at a Christian sports camp changed the rest of my life because I realized it's not about my performance or my role, but it's about the person and relationship that I get to have every single day with Jesus. And so that moment happened. It was super awesome. I'm crying. Other people are sharing. Goes on for about an hour. We go back to our cabins and I'm walking out and the director of the camp comes to me. He says two things. Hey, Cody, man, I'm really proud of you that took courage and now you can have hope in Jesus. And I was like, thank you. And he said, second thing, I'm not sure you can stay at camp. (laughs) 
I'm like, hey, I totally get that. I totally get that. He was like, we want to pray. The leadership team, we're going to pray and see what the Lord tells us. And so they spend the night praying. The next morning, really early, I get a knock at the door. It's the owner of the camp. I'm like, whew. He's like, let's go for a walk. And we go for a walk. And what they decide to do changed the rest of my life. They said, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you. And so what they decided to do is they let me stay at camp that summer. And they put me in deep, authentic community where I got to understand what it looks like to live with people and understand the true power of exposure. When we can live in community and expose our need for Jesus and what that can do for the healing and restoration process of our life. And they also taught me God's word, which was two really, really powerful parts of my story and has changed the trajectory of the rest of my life. As I understand in community, I'm reminded, and by God's word, it's not about the role that I play, but it's about the relationship that I've been invited to have every single day I get to walk with Jesus. And that changed the rest of my life. I've been on a journey since 2008. It has not been easy. There have been ups and downs and sideways moments as as the Lord has taught me about this intimacy that comes with the relationship with him. And every single day, I get the opportunity to lay down And be reminded, hey, in my own flesh, if I'm not careful, I want to pick up a role. And I want to make it about a performance. And I want to say, God, don't don't you love me? Look what all I'm doing for you. And that is a lie from the enemy in the flesh that I have to lay down every single day. It's not about a performance. It's about a person. It's not about a role. It's about a relationship with Jesus that we get to enter into and we get to know him and the hope that he gives us in the person of Jesus. And so as the band comes back up and we're going to enter into a spot of worship, I want to ask you a question and give you an acronym. The question I want to ask you is, hey, are you playing a role that you need to lay down? And the thing about that is only you can answer that question. Are you playing a role? Are you putting on a performance for the perception of others? Or do you really, really, truly care that there's really only one audience and that is the audience of one for Jesus and then to find your hope in the person of Jesus hope for me is an acronym and this is what it means the hope is am I being humble today am I reminding that it's not my own strength but it's in God's strength Am I open to what my community group, what the Lord is telling me to do? Or am I closed off? Am I falling back into that trap? Am I patient? Or am I becoming impatient? And am I wanting to control the things that I can control? Or am I saying, God, you're in control? And then am I enduring with whatever God's season is that he has in my life that he has in your life so every day about lunchtime and before I go to bed I just work through that in my mind it's my hope in the person and relationship of Jesus that I have or is it in my own gifts talents treasures abilities I want my hope to be in Jesus and the power of his name And what he's done for me, not in a role or a performance, but in a relationship and a person. And that is where my hope is found. And it's where your hope can be found as well. Y'all pray with me. Lord, we love you. We're thankful for just your presence, Lord. 
we give you over our mess, our sin, our story. We want to lift your name high. Lord, you are our hope. And there's nothing, nothing that can take that away. Lord, we give you this time and we love you. In your name we pray, amen. God, thank you, Lord, that there's power in your name, that we don't have to live in this superficial, fake role, God, but instead we can walk in you, Jesus, vulnerably in all that you've called us to be. So we thank you, Jesus, for your grace, for the hope that we have in you. We love you so much. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. So I heard earlier that there were some Lee students here this morning. Lee students are here, yeah? Yeah? All right. Sweet. So I was actually a Lee student um, not too long ago, but kind of long ago. It's like kind of in that in-between time, you know? Um, so I, there's two people, right, when you go to Lee. I don't know if you know this or not. If you're a Lee student, you definitely know this. You got people that come to Lee their first semester, and they're like guns a-blazing. I know what I want to do with my life. I know what program I'm getting enrolled in. Like, this is what I'm called to do. I'm going to tackle this in four years or three if you're really smart. Like, I know what I'm going to do. And then there's also the Lee student that comes. They're like, I have no clue what I'm doing here. My dad's a pastor's kid. Uh, like, I'm a pastor's kid, so I just showed up. And I guess I'm just going to throw away, like, tens of thousands of dollars to this institution. And Lord, work it out. <laughs> I wasn't that kid, actually. I actually was the student, though, that showed up like I knew what God had called me to do. Even like senior year of high school, I remember it was the awkward haircut conversation. Any of y'all like get real awkward in haircuts? Ask you all these questions. I just cut my hair, please. Um, it was the awkward haircut conversation. They're like, oh, so what are you going to school for? And I lived in Michigan, and I was like, oh, I'm going to be a youth pastor. Like, oh, what's that? I was like, oh, um, like a pastor for youth. <laughs> Oh, what's that? <laughs> like, oh, you know, just, uh, I'm going to go work at a church. Cool. So, uh, so I knew that's what I was going to do. That was like objective number one, going to be a youth pastor. Objective number two, I'm going to say, I'm sorry, it's embarrassing to say now, but this is the life I lived. It was ring by spring. It was ring by spring. That was objective number two. The Bible says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. I took that personally. I really took that personally. So I did all I could do. Like, I'm going to find my wife, and I'm going to be a youth pastor, and I'm just like, I'm going to change the world. Fire up flames. Like, let's go, baby. And uh, semester one comes around, and... I get into campus choir, which is great. I didn't think it would be great, but I ended up loving it. Um, learned a ton about what it meant to do ministry, praying in the altars for people every week, standing on the risers, leading people in worship. Um, and it was awesome. And then I get a job at the Boys and Girls Club, and I'm doing like real hands-on ministry there, not going to lie. Hands-on, no, not really hands-on ministry, but like hands-on ministry. Sorry, that was a bad joke, but... Um, <laughs> It was, it was a great, great time. <laughs> Praise God. Um, and then, so semester one comes around. It's over. Love in campus choir. Love in the Boys and Girls Club, but single as a Pringle, not going to lie. Um, so year two comes around, and they asked me as a sophomore to be chaplain of campus choir. Um, so I gave, like, really poor 15-minute devotions two to three times a week, like, before um, things would start, and that was great, and I kind of oversee, oversaw, I don't know, I went to Lee, I can't talk, but oversaw the uh, spiritual wellness of the choir, which is great, would have the opportunities to speak in services sometimes, so I was getting really getting that ministry training, um, but after year two, I want to let you know, I did not find my wife, still single. Year three comes around, though, and I meet this girl, things are starting to get serious, and I get an email um, from one of my professors at Lee saying, hey, there's a church an hour and 15 minutes from here, and they're hiring a part-time youth pastor. It's a part-time thing. It's an hour and 15 minutes. You can just drive back and forth um, every Wednesday. So I was like, sweet. That sounds awesome. Um, so I get an interview, and I interview with him at the PCSU, which is like the common area of campus. We sit there in the chair, and he basically offered me the job on the spot. 
I took the job and I was like, oh my goodness. I'm living in the harvest now. It was like the cheesiest church term, but I said it all the time, like, I'm living in the harvest, praise God. Like, I'm living in the harvest. Like, I got a girl that I'm serious about, and then I got, like, a youth pastor job, and I'm driving an hour and 15 minutes. It's not even paying for my gas, but I'm preaching, and this is awesome. Praise God. So youth is going awesome. It's going so well. Like we're repainting the youth center. We're putting up pallet walls because that was the big thing then. Like every church had pallet walls. So I'm like in a warehouse, like sweating with a crowbar, taking off pallet walls and putting them on the church. It was awesome. It was the greatest space ever. We're doing lock-ins. I did lock-ins. Sorry, students. No, we won't do a lock-in. But I was doing lock-ins with them. Everything was great. Like the youth group is growing. The student ministry is growing. People like students are like growing deeper with Jesus. And I'm loving everything about what's going on. And better yet, like the person standing next to me is the person who I loved. I want to spend the rest of my life with. And we're doing it together. And then one Tuesday, had a great day at work, came in Wednesday. um, Because it worked into like a full-time job at this point. Wednesday came. And that was it felt more betrayed than ever. Like Tuesday was literally a great day. Wednesday, the pastor turned on me and I felt more betrayed than ever. And I was stuck packing my entire, guys, I had a dream office. I had an office. That's better than I can say here. I had an office. (laughs) It's awesome. Give to the Beyond Project, please. I need an office. So, Ushers come. No, but seriously, I had an office, like everything was great. And all of a sudden, the whole office is getting packed into my small Volkswagen Jetta. And my girlfriend's sitting shotgun, and it felt like my future was in my rearview mirror. Like the walls still smelt like paint. It was still so new and so exciting. And all of a sudden, I didn't feel like I was living in the harvest much anymore. But I was like, you know what? I got a great girl by my side. I'm going to get through this. A few weeks later, I'm interning, returning the engagement ring I bought to Kay. Went from living in the harvest to saying, God, what are you doing? Went from living in the harvest to feeling alone in the middle of the desert, broken beyond belief, felt betrayed by the church, Felt betrayed by the girl who I loved. Just broken. Frustrated. Felt like I didn't have a future anymore. And I sure as heck didn't have hope. There was a person in scripture who was also in full-time ministry. He was a lot more effective than me. His name was the Apostle Paul. And in scripture, Paul was doing full-time ministry with Silas. And as he was doing ministry, he got thrown into jail. And not your comfy American prison with three meals a day, like a really rough jail. He was beaten, thrown into jail, and shackled in the inner cell. And I don't know about you, but if I'm thrown into jail after doing full-time ministry, I think that's my last day of doing full-time ministry. (laughs) Sorry, I'd like to say I'm a lot more mature of a Christian, but sometimes I don't know that I am. I think I'd probably just quit at that point hang up my hat and say, it was a good run. I'm going to go back to the Boys and Girls Club. Like, it's fine. But in Acts 16, verse 25, it says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Could you imagine? Could you imagine being in prison right after getting beaten? And if you're Silas, you look over and Paul singing, you're a good, good father. I'd be like, shut up, dude. (laughs) That's what just got us beat. But he's singing and praying hymn to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, there's a violent earthquake at the foundations of the prison were shaken. All at once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. Everyone's chains came loose. I don't know what your future looks like this morning. Maybe you did have to return an engagement ring. Maybe you just went through an awful breakup. 
Maybe you just lost the job of your dreams. Maybe your kids aren't living the way you raised them to. Maybe your finances are a mess. I don't know what the future looks like, but I want to let you know this morning, if you'll just keep praising God, if you'll just keep singing, Notice it didn't say they sang a hymn to God. It said they sang hymns to God. That means they sang one song, the chains didn't break, so they sang another. And then they sang another song, and the chains didn't break, so they sang another. Can I encourage you this morning? Sing one more song. Pray one more prayer. Lift up your voice and sing to Jesus. The chains will break in your life. You still have a future. You have a future. Proverbs 16.9 says that the heart of a man plans his ways, but the Lord establishes his steps. Man, I'm so thankful this morning standing on the other side of heartbreak that my plans were surrendered to the will of Jesus. I'm so thankful this morning that my plans didn't work out because God's ways were so much greater. Some of you are praying for the thing to just work out. And God's just saying like, hey, I don't want that to work out because I have something different. I'll never forget praying through heartbreak one time, praying like, God, like restore this so you can fix my heart. Restore this so you can fix my heart, Lord. He said, buddy, I can fix your heart all by myself. I don't have to restore that thing. I got a future for you. And it's greater than you could have ever imagined. So I don't know what you're going through this morning, but can I encourage you to just keep praying, to just keep walking with Jesus, to just keep singing one more song. The chains will break in your life. Tell you what, I, the chains broke in my life and I didn't end up at that church, I've never been back. I didn't end up with that girl, I've never spoken to her again. But here I am, I stand on this stage every week preaching to students and I'm seeing lives being transformed. I'm married to the girl of my dreams. It might not look the way you think it looks right now, but God has a plan. He's got a plan, but do you trust him? It's really hard right now for some of you. It's really hard to see it. But the storm's gonna pass. If you'll just be faithful to him, I promise you, he'll be faithful to you. So public worship's going to come up. And coincidentally, we're going to sing one more song. And for some of you, the chain might break during this song. For some of you, you need to get back in your car, go home, and you need to sing another one. And this week, you just need to keep praying. And you just need to keep pressing. And I truly believe, I believe in all my heart that God is still able to do everything that he says he can do. He's gonna come through, but you gotta submit your plans to his will. Jesus, you're such a good God. God, you write such a better story than we could have ever written for ourselves. You love us too much to let our plans work out. You have a purpose, you have a plan, you have a way. God, I pray for every person in this room this morning that, that seems like they don't have a future. That seems like their future has been shattered. God, will you breathe hope into their lives? Will you show them, Jesus, that sticking with you, that walking with you is worth it? We love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. We're going to stand and we're going to sing. And as we sing, the prayer corner is wide open to you. Some of you this morning might need to get back there and just have some time to pray. There are people waiting to pray with you. Let's worship. <laughs>